Welcome to Bent Not Broken, where we empower and motivate women by sharing real life stories of adversity and provide expert advice on how to overcome those obstacles and help you live your best life. Now here's your host, Juanita Kelly. Hello, friends. Welcome to our first episode of Bent Not Broken. I am your host, Juanita Kelly. I am so excited to be here and present to you our podcast. This has been a true labor of love, and I'm so excited that this concept that I thought of about 10 years ago is actually coming to fruition, and I am so thankful that you guys are here and you're listening to our podcast. Just to give you a little bit of information, Bit Not Broken podcast is about women's topics. We are a for women by women podcast. And I think that's so very important because so many times some of the issues and some of the topics about women or that pertain to women are overlooked. And maybe sometimes they might even be looked at as taboo. We don't think about that at Bit Not Broken. We want to get down to these topics and really help women change their lives for the better. I want everyone to know who's at home, who's listening, that we all have a story. And we've all overcome obstacles. Sometimes some of us are stuck. Sometimes some of us might not feel that they have support group or might not feel that an obstacle can be overcome. They can. And I am proof of that. And I just want you all to know that anything is possible and that any obstacle that you have in front of you can truly be overcome. Well, let's get right into it. Today, I have very special guests by the name of Jennifer Loudon. Jennifer and I will be talking about acknowledging failures and overcoming failures. How great is that, ladies? Today's episode is entitled Failure Reclaiming Your Life. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Bit Not Broken. Today, I have the pleasure of having Jennifer Loudon join us. Jennifer is an author and personal growth pioneer who helped create the concept of self-care with her first publication entitled The Woman's Comfort Book. Jennifer's spoken around the world, written a national magazine column for Martha Stewart's magazine, and even appeared on The Oprah Winfrey Show. Through her books, retreats, and online courses, Jennifer has helped more than a million women create the life that they truly want. Jennifer, welcome. Oh, thanks for having me, and I love the name of your podcast. Well, thank you very much. Jennifer, I I do want to tell you one thing before we get into it. I just want to take a minute and thank you. I saw you as a young woman on Oprah. And because of your words, my path in this life that I'm in changed forever. And I just want to thank you. Oh, my God. Oh, that's fantastic. Because that was one of the worst television moments of my life. (laughs) It was phenomenal for me. I walked away going... I can do better. I can change things. This is, this is awesome. Oh my gosh. That makes me feel so great. Thank you for telling me that. So when I started the podcast and I was putting together a list with my producers of who I wanted to speak to, I wanted you. So I'm so happy and thankful that you chose to join us. Well, it's my pleasure. Thanks for wanting me. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to be wanted, right? <laughs> well, let's go back to the beginning. So I want to get an idea of What happened or what was going on that you said, you know what, I want to become a personal growth pioneer? (laughs) You know, really, that's just my way of saying I'm kind of old. (laughs) No way. (laughs) I mean, I, you know, my first book, The Woman's Comfort Book, was published Mm -hmm. in 1992. Mm -hmm. So really what started, I started off wanting to be a filmmaker. I went to film school. I went to USC film school. I had, without knowing it, a lot of learning. uh, Now we call them differences. Then we called them disabilities but they had never been diagnosed. So I have had a life where a lot of things that I want to do are really difficult for me because of how my brain works. And so when I got to film school, technical things, and this is how, I mean, it sounds so silly, but it, it, it was profound. Like I wanted to be, first, I wanted to be a director. I was too young. I didn't have, honestly, I didn't have the, the confidence. So I thought, well, okay, I'll be a, a cinematographer. And I, back then, it was a ton of math. And I couldn't do the math. And the, I have a lot of spatial issues. And then I was, oh, I'll be an editor. I love editing. And I would, we were working with actual film then, and I would mess up the direction the reels went. But I had 
always been a writer. Like I'd started writing in high school and I'd always struggled to write, which is one of the reasons why I became a writing coach (laughs) and writing teacher and and creativity mentor because of my own struggles. And so really what happened in film school is I turned to writing, but then I really struggled with the business of being in the film business and the politics of it. And that's, I mean, it is, it's a brutal business as many businesses are. And I could have approached it completely differently. And I wrote about that a little bit in my newest book, Why Bother? But I was really trying to be a screenwriter and I was suffering and I was unhappy and I had this great moment. And this story is in the Why Bother book that I had this moment of great surrender where I just was going to give up writing for a while. And that's when the title for the first book came to me as clearly as if someone said it to me. And in fact, I looked around. I thought someone had said it in my little apartment. And it really started my whole career. And then that book became a bestseller and it gave me direction. So Personal Growth Pioneer really could translate as, oh, I fell into that. (laughs) So let me ask you, what should our listeners at home, what should they do if they start feeling lost or or stuck or, or drift? normalize it. Our culture pathologizes. It makes me so angry. You can hear it in my voice. We pathologize falling into why bother, falling into loss, falling into stuck. It is a daily occurrence for most people. And sometimes it goes on for weeks and months. And hopefully, because you're listening to this podcast, it won't go on for years because there's lots of things you can do. But one thing that will keep you stuck is when you think this only happens to me, this is happening because I am broken, there's something wrong with me, right? That fundamental belief, which is sold to you by companies and personal growth people and you name it, and sometimes consciously, sometimes not, that's where you have to start. That's what will keep you stuck. Oh, here I am having the normal human experience of going, what's the point again? (laughs) I was having it this morning. I'm like, oh my God, I was trying to figure something out on Instagram. I'm like, this is so stupid. And why am I even doing this? And I should just sell everything and open a cheese door. (laughs) (laughs) So how, how do you identify or how does someone identify the things that truly make them happy versus the things that only make us think that we're happy? I think we have to stop thinking it's a place we're going to arrive, a place of clarity. I think instead we think this point of life is to be fully present. Okay, that's impossible. Our brains aren't built for it. To be more present, Mm -hmm. to be as alive as I can, to be in this adventure. And so what's leading me towards that and what's leading me away is constantly evolving because the world around me is evolving. I am evolving. So nothing is fixed. So happy or getting to happy or getting to clarity, it can just become another way that we're waiting to live. Wow. So what, what's making you feel good right now in this ridiculous time in history, this impossible, horrible time in history that humans are not built for? Maybe it's like, oh, knitting. And then it has, in our culture, it's like, okay, then you have to open an Etsy shop and you have to become a famous knitter. And like, no. (laughs) Oh, wow. So let me ask you, once we realize the things in our lives that make us happy and we start to understand how we can overcome the question, why bother? What should be our next step down our path? I'm a big believer in yes and holding both the tension of the opposites, lots of ways that people language this. So we hold in one hand, wow, this is what makes me happy. This is what brings me alive. Cool. Let me have more of that. And then we hold in the other hand, what is called your emotional immune system. And your emotional immune system isn't interested in you being fulfilled, living the adventure of your life, being happy, none of that crap. (laughs) Not at all. Mm -hmm. Your emotional immune system is interested in you being safe. And safe means no humiliation, no failure no awkwardness, no anxiety. Oh oh my gosh, every time you follow what brings you alive, what comes up? Fear of humiliation, mistakes, failure. Oh my God, I'm feeling awkward. I can't do this. Beginner's mind, all that stuff. So you have to hold both. I think our culture teaches us this really dangerous story that fulfilling ourselves is going to feel good. It doesn't always feel good. It can feel really exposed. So you have to do experiments. You have to chunk it down into ways that your emotional immune system isn't going to utterly freak out about. So 
go back to the knitting example. No, you're not going to open an Etsy knitting store and be a famous knitter. But how about you decide you're going to try a more difficult knitting pattern? Or you're going to get on an online knitting class and, and let yourself learn, even though it means you're going to feel awkward. Those are the kind of experiments that we want to do to build our emotional immune system, but we totally diss them. And we say, well, that's nothing. I mean, that's so ordinary, Jen. Who cares about that stuff? We want big. We want sexy. We want fast. And that freaks our emotional immune system out. And then we go back to the couch. Mm -hmm. So how would a woman be able to transfer from just being in this, you know, happiness sort of position, this place, and finding the, the happy life that she could feel fulfilled? I think it is in a couple of daily choices that we make. And, mm -hmm. and I was just doing this. I got this. Our insurance company gave us Fitbits this year. Mm -hmm. And they give us $3 a day. And I'm, I'm so cheap. I'm really motivated by this $3 a day. It's hysterical. And one of the things we have to do is we have to take six breaks a day to get up and move around continuously for 500 steps. And I'm actually really digging that part of it because it makes me get up from the chair. Mm -hmm. But while I do it, I play with the dogs. We have a new puppy. And I reset my awareness toward this is my life. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I would say for a happy life, or I like to use fulfilled, is well, you have to remember you are the agent of that. It doesn't live outside of you. It's not in the future when everything is all lined up and perfect and everybody else around you is happy, which is something women do a lot. Oh, I'll just wait till the kids are happy and I'll wait yes. till the partner is happy yes. and I'll wait till everyone I work with is happy. And then, right? No, 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 no. That's never going to come. Never going to come. So what you have to do is go, I am the agent of my life. And then the second thing is, is one of the amazing things about being human is that we get to place our attention where we choose. My dog doesn't get to do that. If I put a bone in front of that dog, <laughs> her attention is going to go. But I can say to the bone, not now. I'm going to put my attention here. And we can do that with our worries. And we can do that with our fears. And we can do it with what we want to create. So like you said here, if I'm sitting here and I'm constantly worrying and I can't get out of this cycle of thinking and worrying and thinking and worrying and I find myself continually doing that what advice would you give me to be able to take a step back and become one with myself and understand what's going on what do you think I should do well one of the most powerful practices that science has backed up is using our senses we are super you know, everyone listening is super smart, super brainy, really great at thinking. And this is, can be really debilitating in the ways you just described, really hard on our nervous system. Mm -hmm. So use your senses in those moments and focus through a sense. It can be through your eyes, but smell is really good. Taste is really good on something that's pleasant and just savor it for 10 or 15 seconds. It starts to break up that, we'll just call it a pattern in the brain that is you're triggering over and over again, the more you trigger it with those obsessive or ruminative thoughts, we might call them, you're ruminating like a cow, <laughs> you're training your brain to do that faster and faster. So you got to retrain your brain. It's not going to necessarily feel comfortable, but it, it can be sensual. And we have to break that attachment to thinking our way to new thoughts and try to use the body. I always say the body is the fastest way in. And then, you know, a thing I use a lot is dance. Put on a song and dance and do moves that you don't usually do because science also backed that up that moves that are out of your normal movement pattern are great for your mood and for breaking up that kind of thinking and energy. You know, I think about your book and why bother and how I can apply that to my own life. I know, for instance, I had a business that was going kind of relatively okay. And I just couldn't figure out how to get to the next level, the next step. And unfortunately, I had to kind of step back away from the business and look at it as a failure. And I thought to myself, should I do this again? Should I try again? Should I do something again? And I kept saying to myself, like, ah, why bother? I'm just going to fail at it again. And I love the fact that your book really helps you focus on how are you going to keep going after a setback? So tell my listeners, what would you recommend someone after they suffered some major step back. Mm -hmm. How would they motivate themselves to move forward and to keep pushing? Well, I think the pushing probably doesn't work. I mean, it works short term, but it doesn't work long term. So I'm a really big believer in 
Well, first of all, time. Like when that disappointment is fresh, when your failure is fresh, you really need to give yourself some compassion and really practice letting yourself feel the ouch. We bypass that so much. We think that feeling our hard feelings is going to swamp us or depress us forever. And of course, if you are experiencing major depression right now, then you need help to feel those feelings. You need a companion, a therapist. Mm -hmm. If you're in your garden variety, I suck. This sucks. Just being able to touch that feeling without the story, right? Without the story that this means something about you. So we go back to your premise here on this show. Yes, I'm bent. Yes, this sucks, but it doesn't say anything about me or my future. Yes. So, you know, sometimes we're going to have to spend some time there and really keep touching those feelings and going, ouch, ouch, wow, that's really hard. That's really painful. Oh, and then we'll drop into, I suck, I suck. It's like, yeah, okay. And then let that go. You know, that is just so simple and so profound. And, and I struggle with it. You know, I struggle with it. I want to get to the solution or I want to spend a lot of time beating myself up for what I did. And neither one of them are helpful until we've really felt those feelings. Mm -hmm. And then I think we go from there to really, what do I have to leave behind? I have these six steps in the why bother process and they're not linear and they're not all essential, but they're just to give you a roadmap. And the first one is leave behind. And when I went through my own couple of years of, of truly Job-like, events go, you know, from life stuff, like my husband at the time had cancer at the same time my dad was dying of cancer. I got a couple really big creative setbacks, including getting fired from that magazine column job you mentioned in my bio and fired from a big brand job that I was a spokesperson for and then ended up getting a divorce. My husband went through a midlife crisis after he got well. I should say my ex-husband, <laughs> I'm remarried. And, um, you know, wow, yeah, that shattered me for a long time. But you know what made it last a lot longer was I couldn't forgive myself. I couldn't move on. Mm -hmm. And I would replay over and over again what I should have done instead about the marriage, what I should have done instead about the divorce and the way I handled the divorce or my dad's death. Again, I write about some of this in the book, but that is the one thing that if I could reach out to each person listening and hold your hand and say, it's time to leave it behind. Because every time you drag that into this present moment, the energy and desire to move forward is stolen. And your life only happens here. Now, I'm not saying we don't learn from things, mm -hmm. but the learning happens here. It doesn't happen in the past where we're saying if only and woulda, coulda, shoulda. And it is, it is such an act of self-betrayal when we keep trying to replay the past and rewrite it from who we are now. Mm -hmm. In your blog, you discuss the importance of knowing what's important in our lives. How can our listeners at home learn to recognize what's the most important thing that's in their lives? I think we have to spend some time with ourselves often in silence or, you know, with nice music or out for a walk in nature, you know, whatever supports you. If you're not a sit still person, if you could see me, I'm, so, I'm, I'm super kinetic. If we ever meet, we'll be like, well, yeah, you probably don't sit still. <laughs> a lot. <then." laughs> um, so it doesn't have to be, you know, silent or sitting still. I, I just want to be really clear about that. But with yourself without the texts going off, without the podcast guest in your ear, like I am in your ear right now, without those kind of interruptions. And mm -hmm. for me, a lot of that will happen when I'm walking or journaling. Those processes really work for me, but you've got to have a conduit to be in relationship with yourself. Otherwise you're reacting and responding and filling yourself up with other people's opinions, voices, and needs. Wow. So let's talk a little bit about about journaling. I know that on your Facebook page, you talk about journaling. Tell me what you feel as though is the most important thing about releasing your emotions onto paper. Well, we don't know why it works, but when you write, and there's all kinds of different ways to do it, there's no right way to do it, y'all, and you certainly do not have to do it every day, so throw that idea out. But when we write, it seems like what happens is from the less, we'll call them the less sophisticated parts of our brain, the more reactive, older parts of our brain, information moves into the more sophisticated, more executive function parts of our brain. And this seems to give us some distance and perspective that really helps us process our life, difficult things, make decisions. 
maybe it's related to a lot of the research of speaking to yourself in the third person or the second person. That's distance self-talk, it's called. That That's shown to really help with ruminative thinking, decision-making, replaying the past over and over again. So there's something that happens in your brain that's good. <laughs> mm-hmm. And making a practice of journaling for yourself when you need it, the way you need it. So I wrote a guided journal after I published White Bother called Get Your Bother On to lead people through the process because people were asking me for it. And some of the feedback I've gotten about that is it's it's shorter, it's easier when you have a prompt and you can write a few lines or you can write a few pages. So look for guided journals that might help you. My friend, Susan Piver, she's a meditation teacher. She's got a great question that she asks, what am I thinking today? Yes. You know, when she's working on a writing project, she'll start with that. Or, you know, what do I need to know today is one that I'll use. Mm-hmm. So some people love things like morning pages where they do three or pages of stream of consciousness every morning. That takes too much time for me. So I use journaling when I'm confused, when I'm scared, when I'm angry, when I'm trying to figure something out. And that's how I use it. And somehow it works well for my brain. Mm -hmm. Well, you shared some tremendous insight today with myself and my audience. I I have to say again, I am just so tickled pink to have you here (laughs) because like I said, you've helped change my life. And you you know what? It's so wonderful because you've never met me. We've never met each other, but you did something for me that I can't say anyone else ever did. And I really appreciate that. Oh. How can our listeners at home find more information about you, your books, and even working with you? Well, before I tell them that, I have to say, you know, you really brought tears to my eyes. And I've been having a real crisis of confidence. I think the pandemic has not been good for my mental health, which is interesting because I'm an introvert and a writer who (laughs) spends a lot of time in this little office by herself. But um, you really, thank you so much. And and I just want to say to everybody, when someone creates change for you or reaches you in some way, man, send them an email. It makes such a difference to creators. It is such a great way to review their work on Amazon or wherever, you know, review their podcast, review this podcast. Please. <laughs> it really makes a difference. You just feel so disconnected sometimes in this digital world. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. And everybody, you can find me at jenniferloudon.com. We have a fabulous community called The Oasis that's a paid membership that's very affordable. And you can find my books and, you know, I all that kind of good stuff. And you can get the first chapter of the Why Bother book for free. Awesome. So everyone at home can and definitely check that out. And be sure to go to her website and sign up for working with you. And she does so much. It's just great. I'm just, I'm just so thankful to have you here. And again, thank you. And I, I don't know what else to say other than you, you, you really just changed my life. And I owe a lot to you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Keep in touch and tell me how it goes and how I can support you. Awesome. I appreciate it, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. On the next episode of Bit Not Broken, we talk with author and psychotherapist Edie Nathan about grief. Thank you all for joining us on our first episode. We'll see you next time. Bye for now. This has been Bent Not Broken with Juanita Kelly. Thanks for listening. You can find us online at www.bentnotbroken.co, all major podcast platforms and YouTube. Be sure to follow us on social media at Bent Not Broken Podcast.